change and seeking solutions, or better put, global climate change seeking solutions. Um, we've had two wonderful speakers this morning, and it is with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kyle Powers White. Welcome, Dr. White. Uh, Dr. White is professor and TIMIC chair at Michigan State University. His research addresses moral and political issues concerning climate policy and indigenous peoples, the ethics of cooperation, cooperative relationships between indigenous peoples and science organizations, and problems of indigenous justice in public and academic discussions of food sovereignty, environmental justice, and the Anthropocene. He is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Dr. Weitz has partnered with numerous tribes, First Nations, and higher indigenous, or indigenous organizations in the Great Lakes region and beyond on climate change, planning and education and policy. He is involved in a number of projects and organizations that advance indigenous research methodologies. These include a group in uh, as far as New Zealand. He has served as an author on reports by the US Global Change Research Program and is former member of the US Federal Advisory Committee on Climate Change and Natural Resource Science and the Michigan Environmental Justice Group. Dr. Kyle's work, Dr. White's work, excuse me, has received the Bunyan Bryan Award for Academic Excellence from Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice and Michigan State University's Distinguished Partnership and Engaged Scholarship Awards and Grants from the National Science Foundation. We are really delighted to have him with us today. Dr. White's, uh, the title of Dr. White's talk is Indigenous Energy Justice and the Climate Change Crisis. Dr. White. Thanks, Professor Mahmoudi. And it's uh, fantastic to be able to connect with everybody that has uh, joined. And I wanted to first acknowledge uh, the Piscataway people and their continuance as self-determining and uh, culturally sovereign and integral people in the, the region that the University of Maryland is in. And I believe that the University of Maryland has its own responsibilities and duties to honor that relationship as well as all indigenous people through their, their programs and institutes uh, and educational and other activities that are part of the the campus community and the campus business. In this presentation, I wanted to give some reflections on issues of energy justice from the standpoint of thinking through solutions. Uh, but by thinking through the solutions, I really want to emphasize some of the key challenges that Indigenous people are facing within the energy sector. And one of my biggest uh, concerns right now is that those of us who are advocating for the energy transition, that we're not focusing enough on issues of justice and equity, and we're also not focused enough on questions about, well, what was the energy system like before the industrial one? What are indigenous and other traditions and trajectories of, of, of energy systems and what perhaps could they teach us about what an energy transition should be like. So in the presentation, uh, I'm, I'm going to gloss over obviously a lot of the, the, the work that I do, uh, but just in, in brief, um, you know, as a Potawatomi person and member of the citizen Potawatomi nation, uh, you know, for me, living in our homelands in the Great Lakes region, uh, it's been important for me to exercise my responsibilities to protect this place that means so much to us and it's been part of our 
traditions for generations. And so a lot of my work is in climate change adaptation planning and building tribal capacity to uh, make decisions and take leadership in climate change, including at the level of climate change policy. I've been part of numerous educational programs to try to build up our nations and communities so that we can make the preparations that we need to. As a humanities scholar, uh, it's been a big part of my work to actually show that for indigenous people, we've been thinking about climate change for generations and that our traditions of climate science are hundreds and hundreds of years old and perhaps are uh, one of our oldest uh, sciences. And that that perspective has given us a unique way of understanding what today is called climate justice as a product of bad relationships and equitable relationships uh, between different human groups. Uh, and that these have been ongoing for some time and that climate change vulnerability is not just about the physical changes in the environment, but about how different types of human social relationships have created certain risks that some populations such as indigenous people face more severely than other groups. And so a lot of my work focuses on understanding problems like colonialism and how that relates to capitalism and industrialization and some of the current policies and laws that make it particularly challenging for indigenous people to not only express their knowledge and perspectives on climate change, but to make those necessary plans. And so I've had really great collaborative relationships with a number of tribes uh, and indigenous research institutes to, to do this work, such as the Sustainable Development Institute at the College of Menominee Nation. And as I've reflected on this work that I've done related to planning for climate change, uh, I have begun to, to get more involved in understanding what we need to do to make sure that the energy transition is one that indigenous people are prominent in, uh, have leadership uh, responsibilities within, and are able to be a major part of both the visioning, but also the the philosophies and approaches to how the energy transition is implemented. So I was going to cover just a little bit about uh, climate change and indigenous people. I want to talk a little bit about some of the risks that indigenous people are facing within the energy transition. And I really want to introduce the folks uh, who are going to be watching this to some of the literature that's out there, not actually necessarily literature that I've been part of or uh, have you know, produced myself, but actually a growing literature that I think is supportive for indigenous people and others to understanding some of the risks that we're facing everywhere. Then I want to briefly touch on, well, what do we mean by an indigenous energy system? Uh, and I was gonna focus a little bit on certain Anishinaabe understandings and philosophies of uh, energy, at least as I interpret it. Uh, Potawatomi people are, are Anishinaabe people and part of that, that larger cultural group. And then I wanted to close with some thoughts on this concept of coordination that I'm gonna discuss quite a bit in the presentation. Uh, but just for now, I wanted to say uh, that oftentimes when we think about indigenous knowledge or indigenous intellectual traditions, whether about climate change or sustainability or another topic, you know, we tend to think that indigenous knowledge mainly provides like information that might be similar or comparable to science or might fill in the gaps. Uh, within scientific analysis, you know, or we think of indigenous knowledge in terms of just like having an attitude of respect or reverence uh, for the environment or for, for non-humans. And I wanna push back on both of those approaches and suggest that there's so much more in the universe of indigenous knowledge, indigenous intellectual traditions. And one of the things that I've found in my own engagement and research is that actually indigenous knowledge systems our knowledge systems that focus on the dynamics that are needed within a society and across societies to be as coordinated as possible to respond to a constantly changing world. And so indigenous knowledge is oftentimes knowledge of social coordination and knowledge of what relationships really matter when we're talking about how a society could respond to a number of different aspects of a world that's constantly in motion, whether it's seasonal aspects, whether it's something like climate change, whether it's uh, the invasion of another society or issues of power and oppression. 
And so I think there's so much more that we can share about how our traditions have important and powerful lessons that people should be exposed to as early in their education as they get exposed to all sorts of other traditions about politics, society, and, and economics to our way of thinking. And one of the concepts I'll just touch on briefly that has been uh, growing in indigenous studies, but also in related fields such as uh, feminist science studies uh, is this concept of kinship. And uh, even though kinship has been developed and published widely in fields like anthropology, people in indigenous studies are really doing their own thing with kinship. And the approach that I've been trying to develop is one angle about what kinship means. And what kinship means is it's a particular way of understanding the relationships that actually build and energize responsiveness within a society. Uh, and so kinship isn't just about like intimate family, uh, though I think oftentimes what people refer to when they refer to family as kin and the importance of family are relationships that as a social unit provide that support for somebody to make individual choices that allow them to be as responsive as possible and that allow everybody in the family to respond in a coordinated manner to the different threats and risks and opportunities that are around them. But actually kinship can be understood as being part of friendship relations, professional relations, diplomatic relations, there's different scales of, of kinship. Uh, and they don't all uh, gravitate toward, uh, you know, being somebody's best friend or being somebody's family member, right? There's all sorts of different levels and scales of, of kinship. And it's one part of the, the, the world of, of morality and ethics. It's not the only or the fundamental part. It's, it's one part. And I think it's a, a, a part that is particularly needed when we talk about solutions to a number of problems, uh, including climate change. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to, uh, to touch on. So to begin, in my work with uh, the National Climate Assessment, which is kind of like the uh, United States uh, version of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where the authors synthesize just multiple studies and uh, research and testimonies on uh, climate change. Uh, you know, we have a tribal chapter that just focuses on issues that Native folks in the U.S. context in that sphere are are facing and expecting related to climate change. Uh, and I've also worked internationally on similar types of projects to understand uh, what risks Indigenous people are are facing, what concerns they have about climate change. And so I've heard like hundreds and hundreds of folks just talk about why climate change matters to them, why they're concerned about it. And what's always struck me in these conversations I've I've had is that when you're listening to, to Native people, Indigenous people's, uh, you know, testimonies about, you know, what their concerns are, what they're doing to prepare for climate change, you know, while they're definitely concerned about the actual uh, physical change itself, like, you know, the environmental impact, the, the severe drought, uh, the coastal erosion or something else. Uh, what's oftentimes most highlighted though, is that they don't feel that there's coordination between the groups that they need to work with to prepare and to anticipate uh, or to mitigate climate change, whether that's uh, a county government or parish government or a state government or a provincial government or federal government, whether that's private industry or or nonprofit. And so people oftentimes are going to focus a lot more on the policy side, the law side, the, 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 the side of uh, social equality and, and, and social issues when they talk about what the climate change risks are. And in this report that we did in the tribal chapter, you know, I think you can see this, that when the authors on this chapter looked at what the literature, the testimonies, and other sources we reviewed were saying. You know, it, it, on the one hand, it's about indigenous livelihoods and economies at, at risk, right? But, you know, notice here that uh, institutional barriers to self-determined management is referenced as a key dimension of that. So an issue of coordination look at our second key message, right, uh, about physical, mental, indigenous values-based health at, at risk, right, so kind of the existential 
aspects of, of climate change. You know, again, looking at indigenous health as part of interconnected social and ecological relationships around them, you know, meaning that it's not like just the, the climate change impact, the physical part is what creates the, the health issue or the uh, uh, you know, other type of, um, uh, you know, mental uh, uh, or cultural issue, right? But it's that uh, already there's a layer of, of trauma. There's uh, a layer of you know, having to work very hard as indigenous people to be able to continue certain relationships to the environment, given how much land use change has been part of colonialism. Uh, and so for that reason, right, we're, we're not just concerned about climate change itself, but how climate change uh, comes at a time where there are already so many unresolved issues and challenges that we're facing, spanning education and uh, gender and uh, policy and legal rights and treaties uh, and many other, many other issues. And in cases where we're talking in our third key message about actual issues of displacement or managing disasters, right? Again, the, the literature showed that it's the institutional barriers that are limiting the adaptive capacities uh, and include issues like access and policies and programs and, and, and funding. And the fact that indigenous people are highlighting these things is not just because these are issues that affect uh, all groups of people, uh, but in particular, we're finding that the relationships of coordination that we need to be able to prepare for climate change are lacking even more than for many other communities within the context of the United States. And I think Native people in other parts of the world are going to share a similar view. Uh, and so looking at particular cases, say, of displacement or resettlement, right, like the Ile de Jean Charles or the, the uh, village of Kivalina, Alaska, you know, again, it's politics. Uh, existential issues are cited in this report as a, a key way to begin to talk to climate change, to talk about climate change. So here then, we've got an understanding of what it means to be at risk or face risks due to climate change. But it's really about being in a situation where due to colonialism and other highly unethical and unjust laws, policies, and ways of treating indigenous people uh, that we don't have the relationality and the that, that would drive the coordination that would actually be needed to analyze the risks, to respond to them, uh, and to be able to take leadership in that response. And so we can understand this as a problem of, of coordination. Uh, and that's another way, it's another angle of thinking about ethics and, and justice or about climate injustice. It's not just that the higher concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which came from certain industries, are uh, then having an une or, or, or making an unequal burden of, of harms and risks on some groups. It's that also, you know, histories of injustice that go right up to the present are framing and shaping and affecting our capacity to respond. Those issues aren't dealt with, and, and many of those issues, for most people, wouldn't even sound like they're related to the climate change uh, because they're they're so old and they've gone so far back in the, the history of settler nations like the United States. But we know, and I'm not going to, just for reasons of time, go into detail on this, right? But we know that, to put it lightly, Indigenous people are facing also problems of coordination uh, in how we're impacted by the current fossil fuel industries. Uh, you know, issues like the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, are unfortunately a, a horrible example of that, right? Where for the Standing Rock tribe who had expressed multiple times that it wasn't interested in having that pipeline run so close to its reservation and within its ancestral territories, but the consultation process and the environmental assessment process that the Army Corps of Engineers did in partnership with the builders of the pipeline didn't really appreciate indigenous people's consent or didn't really appreciate that uh, 
there was a larger history of land dispossession that made it so that putting a pipeline there was a horrible idea and extremely unjust and extremely unethical. And also for indigenous people, given decades of being displaced and polluted by fossil fuel industries, it's not just, oh, this is a, this is one pipeline. It's part of a large network and history of being people who have had to survive all sorts of hardships caused by the fossil fuel industry. And so whether it's the US consultation policy, whether it's uh, uh, the way in which locations are, are cited and spotted for pipelines and other aspects of fossil fuel infrastructure, uh, there's also a <laughs> extreme lack of coordination there as well, which means that indigenous people are oftentimes uh, armed and face risks, um, including one of the most devastating risks to our uh, communities, which is sexual violence, uh, with literature from the, the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, and other government agencies, as well as work by people like uh, Sarah, have shown that in oil producing areas or areas where there's been an oil boom or other fossil fuel boom, that violent crime increases and that sexual violence uh, against Native women and girls can also be seen as intensifying uh, in those particular areas uh, because of the, the man camps and the labor situations that are set up to be able to, uh, to generate the capacity for those booms. And so in that way, right, the environmental justice issues associated with the fossil fuel industry also just demonstrate a complete lack of just relationality uh, and make it hard for any indigenous people to be able to feel that they can take leadership in the transformation and change in the fossil fuel industry, uh, given that we're still dealing with so much harm. Now, in, in this sense, right, I, I think that a, a lot of folks, uh, a lot of environmentalists would, you know, like totally agree with, with everything that I just said, or maybe not, but regardless, I mean, I don't oftentimes encounter like that much resistance against environmentalists to those types of ideas. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, when those of us who are environmentalists, when we talk about the solutions to climate change, especially the different types of solutions that would be part of like an energy transition or a change in, in land use, all the types of stuff I just shared um, is sort of not considered to really be that related to that. And sort of maybe even perceive that, you know, if you support something like uh, forest conservation or, you know, uh, 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 wind power, that moving forward, those are gonna be good things. And if we can just get them to work, then uh, then be able to lower concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and begin to, to tackle uh, climate change and, this issue of climate justice. And for a while, you know, I think I was probably guilty of uh, a bit of that as well, just kind of thinking about solutions from a technological standpoint, despite all the research and work I'd done on other issues. But then as some of these solutions have been implemented or they've been tried out or experimented on particular locations, we're beginning to see a lot of literature emerge that show that some of the same types of problems that indigenous people face within uh, climate change adaptation or then the fossil fuel sector, there's no reason to actually think that these problems are not present within the energy solutions as well. Uh, and perhaps the energy transition, which so many people believe is just an inherently good thing, will be looked at 50 years from now as just like every other colonial intervention that in its own time period was looked at as a uh, you know, intrinsically good thing, uh, but will be something where when we look back on it, we'll see that it infringed on indigenous rights. It led to uh, uh, displacement. It harmed indigenous people and indigenous people in all different parts of the world didn't really emerge as, as leaders or beneficiaries of it, but further had their rights curtailed and their cultural integrity uh, harmed. And so, for example, I've been looking at a lot of literature by others that uh, has been demonstrating this. You know, so for example, 
Catherine Sandoval uh, in her work on uh, energy infrastructure and energy networks within uh, California, you know, has pointed out that for a lot of indigenous people, you know, it's first of all the case that our tribes aren't even that plugged into energy systems and networks. So to suggest that like we're in a position to take advantage of a huge transition uh, is is a problematic thing to say actually because uh, uh, we have decades of actually being cut out of the energy sector. And so to suggest that we're going to be able to quickly integrate within any transition uh, is actually setting up for a situation of further injustice based on that compound history of being denied uh, a place and a, a beneficiary capacity within the energy system. Or if you look at energy sources like uh, wind or solar, uh, you know, solar, for example, well, I'm not going to mention this that much here, but, you know, obviously, Solar is an example, like many of the, uh, many of these technologies, where the the supplies and resources need to build it are based on mining and other extractive practices, which have ethical and justice issues. And it, but in terms of the actual policies that would make it so that indigenous people would be able to uh, uh, participate in leadership roles in the energy transition that would feature technologies, it, it, the, the literature is actually showing that uh, the way that those policies or programs are, are designed for renewable uh, energy are ones that don't really consider the, the policy challenges or the legacies of power and oppression that indigenous people have to reckon with. And while there might be a few demonstration projects or projects where a tribe or indigenous community, you know, is able to use a, 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 a new technology at a small scale, uh, that shouldn't be celebrated at the expense of realizing that there are serious institutional barriers to that uh, make it challenging for actually tribes like in the US context to, uh, to emerge as, as, as leaders within the energy transition. And I'm not gonna cover just here in the presentation some of the details. I'd actually encourage folks to look at the literature because the, the, the literature goes into some of the intricacies of uh, institutional barriers and policy that a lot of folks, environmentalists don't even know about. And these are issues that tribes and native folks face within the United States context. But similarly, in my experience, even though the, the details are different, indigenous people all over the world face challenges that are comparable or, or analogous in their complexity and in the fact that so many people that advocate for the energy transition don't even know anything about this entire uh, uh, kind of body and sector of law, policy, and 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 social interactions that uh, that that shape indigenous capacities uh, to exercise uh, leadership and to grow their economies and cultures in the way that they want to, uh, to to do, and based on what's best for their communities and their memberships. But we're also seeing with these technologies that actually, again, they're their their placement, um, you know, where the technologies go, where the clean or renewable technologies go involves uh, displacing indigenous people or threatening indigenous people's cultures. Uh, and so in political ecology, there's a number of studies that are coming out talking about how supposed renewable energy is occurring in ways that don't really respect indigenous people's consent, that don't set up reciprocal uh, financial arrangements, and that ultimately we're not uh, things that were done in ways that indigenous people choose. For a lot longer, the UN RED program, the Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation program, has been criticized by indigenous activists. And there's now a growing peer review literature that is looking at how, with respect to, you know, to RED uh, all over the world, uh, that it's one that oftentimes is tied to displacement of indigenous people. It's oftentimes tied to uh, mechanisms for sharing the, the financial gains of red programs that are not uh, good for indigenous people, but also uh, sometimes and in some cases, a lack of respect for indigenous uh, contributions to uh, stewarding and sustaining forests well, uh, that don't necessarily show up within uh, the RED program. Now, RED has gone, has been through a lot of different changes and adaptations. So, you know, if you're not like a specialist in RED, I think it can be challenging to keep up with 
all the different ways that Redis tried to respond to different criticisms. But the point being here is that it wasn't sort of automatic that you know a forest conservation program would uh, you know would just be one in which indigenous people would uh, fit right into and take leadership into. There were serious issues of coordination, and of course, hydropower of all things is emerging in different places as a climate change uh, solution. And uh, hydropower has been bad historically for indigenous people going all the way back, uh, and it still is, right? So, like in Canada with the Site C project, you know, if, if you look at some of this work that's been done in relation to British Columbia, it's been shown that the way that the large Site C dam has been set up has disrespected treaty rights. Uh, and a reporter, investigative journalist uh, Emily Gilpin. Uh, then actually showed in her examination that some of the communities that are are closest to the Site C dam, they're also being cut out of the energy sector in ways that a lot of people wouldn't recognize. So in her investigative reporting, uh, she talked to folks who said, well, they were trying to um, to plan some of these uh, First Nations were actually trying to plan their own energy system and to take leadership within the emerging renewable energy sector, and that that was going to be a, a big thing for their economy and for their position within the region, right? Their leadership. Uh, but then the site C dam just kind of eliminated that possibility by by taking away that that market, that opportunity for them. And so these are, are silences and and disappearances that oftentimes environmentalists are not thinking about. But at the United Nations level, uh, such as the work by the Special Rapporteur on the rights of indigenous people, I've been pointing out this type of thing for a while, uh, that mitigation processes, whether hydropower or forest conservation or others, that they're not ones that are necessarily that ideal for uh, indigenous people. And so when we think about like these solutions and the energy transition, the history of a bad system of coordination, whether we're talking about the context I'm most familiar with in the United States or globally, which I become familiar with too, and a lot of the work and the, that I do and the relationships that I have, that, that lack of coordination just carries over uh, into the energy transition. And so I, so I think a lot of indigenous persons now are wondering, is this just another one of those phases of uh, colonialism where we uh, uh, actually get threatened and have to endure harms and have to survive horrible challenges and barriers and 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 damages uh, for the sake of the world trying to save everybody else. Uh, and so in a lot of ways I've been looking at this just kind of thinking anecdotally and speculatively, you know, if you're an indigenous people who due to a clean energy project were displaced, then 50 years from now, even if the concentrations of greenhouse gases are lowered, you're experiencing massive climate change issues by having to adapt to a completely new environment, probably in an area where you have less land. And so how is that going to be any better for you? Uh, even if all sorts of other parts of the world, especially places where privileged people live, uh, feel that they somehow uh, came up with a solution to the climate change problem. And the, the crisis then, right? <laughs> because so often we just think about, well, what are the technological solutions or, or just what are the solutions in general and can they work? Uh, we completely gloss over that when you at a high level begin to fund and put those things in practice, that they're oftentimes going to unravel because we still have not reckoned with the fact that generations of colonialism have made it so that we don't have the coordination that is needed to implement any of this in a way that would create a scenario that would be different to indigenous people than other environmental injustices. So the energy transition would just be another environmental injustice and would be reflected on as such after the fact. Because when I read about the history of different types of colonialism, everybody at the time was always just as fervent as environmentalists are today. And due to the different aspects of that time period, we're not able to understand or interpret or we're not willing 
to take action uh, to do things any differently. And so while we think that today, definitely different, we're, we're smarter, uh, we're more historically informed today, that, that's not necessarily true. And I don't think we want to take that for granted uh, that we are necessarily better just because we're attempting to do something at a regional and global scale today as opposed to 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And so I get concerned that as the crisis rhetoric uh, intensifies to bring attention to climate change, that it creates swifter action. When you take swift action in a world in which the conditions and relationships of coordination are not adequate, that's a recipe for injustice. And so what I have been doing, and, and just what I'll, I'll close with here, is uh, thinking about ways in which we can be more prepared to understand this issue. And I realize that the literature on energy justice almost never says anything about what were other energy systems uh, prior to the industrial energy system. Like, well, how do people even understand energy? And what I've been looking at by going into Anishinaabe traditions is actually finding out that even though there might not be a word for energy or a, you know, a, a cognate for energy, that we totally had a multiple philosophies of energy and they spoke actually to very, very different issues. In fact, one of the key points that I found is that it wouldn't have even been possible to speak of energy without at the same time speaking of coordination and consent and reciprocity and kinship. So there'd be no such thing as saying, here's an energy system or an energy solution. Now let's figure out the coordination part. Now let's figure out the justice part. Actually, all those things were just baked into each other. So like, for example, if one of our ancestors looked at like the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Keystone XL Pipeline, they wouldn't call that energy. That's not energy because there's no consent built into that. There's no relationality of coordination built into that. There's no kinship built into that, right? It's not tied to a, uh, uh, a way of thinking about motion and energy that generates responsiveness to change around you. And so to take an indigenous approach, right? You know, colleagues, Deborah and Hillary McGregor always, always remind us that within our story traditions that uh, oftentimes we, we have all these traditions about thinking about uh, climate change or energy. And, you know, a lot of our stories are about how humans sort of didn't understand how to be in sync with all the motion around them. And actually they had to ask permission to non-humans, to animals and plants. They actually had to ask the consent and they had to demonstrate reciprocity that if they were going to live well in a region, that they were gonna be plugged into all of that motion and animacy around them that they had to be reciprocal, they had to be consensual, right? Which are things that are lacking in the energy system uh, and with respect to climate change preparedness, as I talked about it earlier. So actually our traditions of energy are about being coordinated uh, with an entire sort of seasonal world and constant motion, constantly motioning world around you, both within the dimensions of a year, but also across years, trending across years, similar to you know, how we might talk about something like climate change over the long term. And it was all about coordination. It was all about how you build those relationships that support coordination to be able to just grapple with all of the motion and animacy and change that's, that's happening. And so when you look at what some of our, you know, our, our elders and our scholars and our leaders say when they even talk about our, our language, and this might be a little bit too big to, uh, uh, to digest here for the, the presentation. But if you notice, just looking at a concept like what does it mean to keep the land, it's referring to an overall system of coordination uh, uh, that occurs across an entire landscape. Uh, and that, that that's what, what stewardship means. It's not individualistic consumer actions. And when you even get more into the details, right? And I encourage you to look at Christine uh, C's work, right? When you look at some of our concepts that would be related to energy, right? Like the word for land or, or earth, it's always about animacy and constant motion and movement uh, in her interviews with, with elders and knowledge keepers, right? But, but to understand what it means to actually be in coordination with that uh, movement, to be, to be plugged into it, sorry to use a fossil fuel metaphor, right? But uh, to be you know, included within the right way, 
you have to have those those kinship bonds, right? Inclusivity, reciprocity, mutuality. And so kinship there is considered to be actually integral to a system of coordination that makes it possible for people to uh, to, to to be in a world that's constantly moving and changing, which you, you can't predict. Uh, uh, you can engage in foresight, you can engage in, you know, respectful speculation, but you have to constantly acknowledge that there's so much complexity and change happening around you. And it's those kinship bonds that will give you that responsiveness across society. And so Margaret Noden, for example, in her studies of uh, Nishinaabe language, again, right, looks at this word, uh, which is sustainability, as involving animacy, but then being equal partners, uh, right? So again, equality and also you know, reciprocity, uh, you know, built into that just very uh, understanding. And in some of the work I've been doing then, uh, I've been trying to think about this, right? That if we understand coordination energy, right? It's a way of, of thinking. And some of this has come out of work I've done with uh, Samantha Chisholm Hatfield on uh, indigenous seasonal time and ways of thinking about the seasons. But, you know, there's cues and changes and motion that's all around us. You understand those things, not just as physical changes, but as things that affect or are responded to by collective and coordinated relationships and activities. Those activities are, are going to be more powerfully coordinated when they have kinship in them. Kinship refers to particular types of relationships. Oftentimes, indigenous people talk about responsibilities. That's one of them. But responsibilities are going to be more conducive to responsiveness if they're layered with generations of ceremonializing and teaching these qualities like consent or equality or reciprocity. And that the more you have something like, say, consent or reciprocity in your relationships, whether they're family relationships or diplomatic ones, the more your collective relationships, your social relationships are gonna be able to respond to the cues and changes and, and motion uh, in the environment. And so climate change solutions then are ones that actually we first need to attend to repairing kinship, repairing the relationships of coordination that have been threatened and, and harmed for generations. And if we begin to put the climate change solutions as the main topic and have the, the kinship follow behind, then what's the difference between previous forms of colonialism? But the challenge we have to face actually is that it's not just that there's a tipping point that's related to something environmental or ecological. Because kinship and relationality is also about a system and it's about responsiveness and about adaptation and change. That system has a tipping point too, but maybe the difference is that tipping point already passed in a lot of places. We already crossed that, that tipping point. So like in the contemporary United States, I would say that you know, we don't have the coordinated kinship responsiveness that we need, that, 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 that tipping point is crossed. Uh, and so, it might take a long time to repair, establish, and rebuild, but what if that takes longer than the actions that are needed to deal with tipping points related to the environment or climate system? And I think that that's a much more compelling challenge and pushes us to actually ask ourselves what our values and priorities are, what our ethics are, when we realize that the kinship system, the coordination system, uh, is itself one that requires that attention, but it's not necessarily going to be synced or timed with interventions that are just directed to the climate system. All right, thanks for a chance to, 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 to share with you. I look forward to chatting more in the, the question response session. Dr. White, thank you so much for that very interesting, but also such a wonderfully holistic approach to this crisis in, in terms of what you mentioned about relationships, kinship, and, and the whole coordination energy uh, model. I think there is so much to learn from what you have presented to us today.
I will now turn it over to Kate Seaman for uh, the question and answer period. Thank you again. Thank you, Hoda. Um, Professor White, I'm going to ask you if you can stop sharing the slides and then people can see you a bit better for the question se section. Um, and again, just a reminder, we have the question and answer chat box on the right hand side for questions from the audience. So you guys can go ahead and, and start popping those in there and I will will read those out. Um, but to get started, I, I had a, a quick question and one of the really important things I think you were highlighting is this lack of coordination amongst groups um, and the challenges that then poses for Indigenous groups to access into debates and, and to have their um, their needs met and their opinions heard. So how do you think that that coordination could be improved to ensure that access is given to those that, that need that access? Yeah, thanks for your uh, question, Dr. Seaman. Uh, the, the, I guess the shortest way to, uh, to address that is to actually look at how often tribal leadership engages with state, federal, local leadership, as well as with uh, nonprofit uh, or the corporate sector. And when you look at crisis response and even just uh, thinking about the horrendous challenges that so many people are facing with COVID-19, and just listening to how leaders talk about how they're, they're handling things. And oftentimes when we're thinking about, say, just you know, like in the US context, you know, white people uh, or different privileged people, they're oftentimes able to just give each other a call or they've had multiple chances to meet somebody or engage with somebody over the course of the year. Or there's policies that have already been laid out and that are, are renewed, acknowledged each year in trainings and programs, right, about how those relationships are supposed to work. But then when it comes to indigenous people and also, uh, of course, uh, people of color communities uh, and others, if we're talking about the United States context, that layer of relationality, that layer of depth and, and intimacy and diplomacy isn't actually present annually in how we interact within governance. And that shows in a crisis situation. And so I oftentimes am in these meetings where uh, say it's a, a climate change issue or a kind of a, a crisis issue and somebody from like a federal agency or local government comes into a meeting with tribal leadership and not only is it the first time they've ever been in such a context, but they say something like, well, can you guys tell me about treaty rights or can you guys tell me about, you know, the government to government relationship? And it's just like, wow, if you're starting from that point, um, how could you possibly be somebody who could be counted on to respond in a crisis? Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, how can we understand the virus developments of the current situation in the Navajo Nation as an extension of the lack of relationships, consensuality, and the legacies of settler colonialism? Um, and also, how has the virus impacted your community? Thank you. Thanks for the, the question. So I'm not knowledgeable about uh, you know, some of the direct like facts and uh, you know, other aspects or dimensions of COVID-19. Uh, but what I will say is that in talking to people, including folks that I know very well from the, the, the Navajo Nation, if you look at how many of our tribal communities are, are organized now, to be able to interface with the United States, we have these like bureaucratic structures uh, that they're not necessarily the ones we choose. They're not the ones that our ancestors uh, wanted, uh, but they're ones that we've had to adapt to and they're extremely limited. They're very difficult in terms of being able to communicate and they're oftentimes supported by industries that aren't fantastic, including the fossil fuel uh, industry. We also have issues with healthcare delivery uh, which, depending on the tribe uh, uh, and their particular situation with their healthcare infrastructure, is not going to be particularly great for dealing with uh, a pandemic. And with respect to, uh, to, to, to my community, 
for people in a lot of Anishinaabe tribes living in cities or living in reservation or other types of, uh, of, of communities, there are a lot of people that are showing concern, but a lot of people that are concerned about having the capacity to take care of our, our relatives. And so there's an active conversation going on trying to figure out who's in need, how can we find ways to support creatively, and how do some of our traditional communication networks, uh, how can they be, be helpful in this situation where we're practicing social distancing mediated by technology? That's great, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. So I'm gonna, I'll give you one at a time in order. Um, so the first one is how um, can and should America transition from the current energy structure and consumption to one based more on kinship? I think people, and I appreciate the question. I, I think people who are, 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 which everybody should be, right, are, are making voting decisions and other choices about their political involvement that is pushing for an energy transition need to think about actually some of the gaps in their advocacy. So, for example, uh, if you look at an issue like, uh, just to refer to one that I know people are aware of, right, the Dakota Access Pipeline. That issue, a lot of a lot of it, not all of it, right, but a lot of it turned on the fact that the U.S. consultation policy and the U.S. environmental assessment policy is actually not one that protects consent, reciprocity, trust. If you look at how those policies are are written and laid out, they don't reflect kinship, but actually they're supposed to, right? Like if you look at environmental assessment, the moral purpose of something like that is trust. So why wouldn't it reflect trust in how it is enacted or consultation? That actually the moral foundation of that should be consent. And so people that are making voting decisions or, 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 or decisions about what they're going to advocate for, even if it's on social media, need to add information about that into what they're pushing their leaders to do. So that an environmental uh, agenda should actually be about getting politicians who ordinarily don't think about what they do in Washington or in state capitals uh, as involving tribal consultation to actually advocate for changes to that. And that that would be a way of bringing kinship into a policy process that could even eliminate the possibility of the fossil fuel industry being able to expand within the current situation. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, first of all, starts with a compliment, a very amazing, thank you for an amazing presentation. So thank you again. Um, and then in your experience, how do you think is the best way to apply indigenous knowledge within environmental sustainability without overly romanticizing it? Thanks for the question. I appreciate your encouragement. Uh, absolutely. So, so the one thing on, you know, romanticization is that, you know, indigenous people didn't, um, you know, kind of create that particular issue. And it's been kind of one of the dual threats that I face uh, in my work as somebody that advocates for indigenous knowledge and seeks to empower uh, indigenous knowledge keepers, right? On the one hand, you have the people that think that it's not uh, knowledge. And I would argue that, well, that there still are a lot of people like that out there. Um, maybe they're getting less, right? And there's more people that are like, well, wait a minute, science and uh, uh, all sorts of other knowledge systems all have their own histories and trajectories and there's not one that's like privileged. Uh, but then the other part of, part of that, right, is the, the romanticization. And one of the big problems is that people need to really stop asking the question of what does indigenous knowledge do for other people? What does it do for humanity? I have a paper called What Do Indigenous Knowledges Do for Indigenous People? I have a paper that Indigenous Lessons uh, on Sustainability are not for all humanity or are not just for all humanity. And by virtue of asking that question of what do Indigenous knowledge systems do for us, everybody, already one's down a pathway that's not great. Because Indigenous knowledge systems are not supposed to be the best. They're not supposed to be, you know, the most this or the most that. They're the knowledge systems our communities develop over hundreds of years to survive and flourish. And they're continuing to change and adapt. And for us, 
we're trying to rebuild our knowledge systems so that we have access to trustworthy knowledge that comes from our community. So we don't just have to depend on other people for knowledge, right? And so the way we avoid romanticization is by not asking what do indigenous knowledges do in terms of like information or what do they do for global sustainability? But how is it that all of us can work to protect the resurgence, the, the reinvigoration, the uh, revitalization, the renewability and so on of knowledge systems that all communities can trust? Because as indigenous people, we don't wanna have the same problem that you know, like the IPCC has, where you have people that don't trust it or operates at a high abstract level. And there are people that don't know how the information affects their action, right? And they're excluded oftentimes from being members in it unless you have like a PhD or a scientist. We don't want that issue. We want an issue where like our ancestors had it, our knowledge systems were accountable. They were trustworthy. People listened to them and everybody had a voice in it. And somebody who is a knowledge keeper had to interact face to face the people who were the beneficiaries or those who might be harmed from the knowledge and had to explain it to them. And so people that are supporting that project of restoring trustworthy knowledge systems within our communities, that's the pathway to sustainability because if all of our communities, even at the local level, are resilient and sustainable, then that is much more better way of thinking about it than a situation where privileged people are sustainable and everybody else is struggling uh, to survive. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple more questions um, and hopefully enough time to get, get through them. What I might do is just give you the last two in one go, if that's okay. Um, sure. And then you can kind of answer those. Um, so the first one is, and this feeds off what you were just saying is, do you think that the lack of coordination is also a result of a communication crisis between um, Indigenous groups and then those in, in power. Um, and then the second is that there's an emerging movement in the West calling for recognition and protection of rights for nature to mitigate climate change um, and environmental degradation. Do you see promise in this approach to addressing the climate problem? Thanks for the, the questions and I'll, um, I'll, I'll respond. Uh, the, the time I have left. So absolutely, that's a key point about about communication. And you know, I've done a lot of research on looking at norms of partnership and collaboration from an indigenous perspective. And a lot of that has to do with communication and patterns of communication, how communication is understood. So I wish I had more time to share more about that, but I completely agree that that is a key area to look at. Now, with regard to to rights or personhood as assigned to um, non-humans. Uh, so if, if you look at those uh, movements uh, that have achieved that in different parts of the, the world, right? What I think a lot of folks will say is that that is a positive development if it translates into greater kinship. That is, if the process for making that legal intervention and change further built kinship and if afterwards the policy is used to continue that kinship building process, then it's a great solution. But if you just get the, the right or the personhood and then that's it, um, and it's just seen as an adversarial legal tool or one that rallies controversy, then you actually haven't uh, achieved kinship, even if people are still able to advocate for indigenous rights using it as adversarially. Um, but adversarial legal stuff, even though we have to use it, is is not the matter of coordination and kinship, and it also takes a long time usually to to work those uh, uh, legal mechanisms. But anyways, I wish I could say more about that, but I think I'm out of time. Right on time. So thank you very very much again for taking the time to talk with us, and um, we really appreciate it. Um, we will be stopping now for our lunch break for today. Uh, so we will come back again around 2 p.m. We'll be restarting. Um, that's with Dr. Victoria Keener, who's from the East West Center in Honolulu in Hawaii. So we have to give them time to wake up. So <laughs> we will be back around 2 p.m. So we hope you all can come back and join us again. Um, and thank you again very much uh, for your presentation. It was fantastic. Um, and yeah, thank you all.